disturbance, what you really did was pluck the strings. Now Maxwell states very clearly that he set about to actually capture exactly what Faraday was doing in his lines of force in the theory, and that's what he did. Maxwell's actual theory is 20 equations and 20 unknowns. In quaternions, which is a higher topology algebra, you can do things in that that you can't dream of in doing in tensors. And you certainly can't do in vectors, and you certainly can't do with the theory that's taught at our universities. All that remains to be rediscovered and uncovered. The now famous Michelson-Morley experiment at the turn of the century failed to detect a stationary ether, so classical physics presumed once and for all that it did not exist. The case was closed until quantum mechanics reopened the discussion, allowing for a new interpretation of how matter interacts with a zero-point field. Most of our scientific community actually believes that empty space, the nature of, of, of space itself, is completely empty, devoid of anything. And historically, it's very interesting because in the 1800s and even earlier, they believed there was an ether, an all-pervading substance filling up space. And in 1905, when relativity theory became very popular, they said, well, we don't need this ether. It's comp uh, empty space is empty. Then 25 years or 20 years later, in 1925, when quantum mechanics comes into play, all of a sudden, a new energy appears in equations of quantum mechanics, and it has to be there to make the equations work, and it has to, it has to do with fluctuations of electromagnetic field energy at a very high frequency that interacts with everything. And they call this the zero-point energy, and it turns out that all the elementary particles interact with this energy, and it becomes a potential energy source. That's what we're discovering today. Well, free energy is basically, uh, and another word for it is zero-point energy. It's energy that is contained within the vacuum of space and which is virtually undetectable by any traditional means. In fact, uh, the, the energy is uh, homogeneous and isotropic, the same everywhere, the same in all directions. And because of that, it's uh, trying to extract it or measure it is sort of like the problem of trying to weigh a beaker of water underneath the surface of the ocean. Uh, what do you measure with respect to what? And that's been the physicist's dilemma, and we've gone down uh, one very large cul-de-sac this century. Uh, the cul-de-sac being that there is no such thing as consciousness. There is no such thing as this zero-point field, or this, this place from which the energy can come. And uh, the answer now appears to be yes, because uh, theoretical physics and a number of experiments and quantum mechanics show very clearly the existence of this, this all-pervasive electromagnetic field called the zero-point field. In fact, although skeptics often point to Einstein's theory of relativity, it was Einstein who in 1920 said, There are weighty arguments to be adduced in favor of the ether hypothesis. To deny the ether is ultimately to assume that empty space has no physical qualities whatsoever. The fundamental facts of mechanics do not harmonize with this view. According to the general theory of relativity, space is endowed with physical qualities. In this sense, therefore, there exists an ether. According to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable. The term vacuum has been used in several totally different senses. Uh, some engineers use it to mean you just pump out all the air and that's called a vacuum and that's vacuum technology. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about empty space-time. We know today, for example, the Lamb shift in quantum mechanics showed that th this exchange of energy between the vacuum and the charged particles is in fact real and generates real effects. And you can measure it, and he was given the Nobel Prize, Lamb was, for doing that kind of measurement and showing it in the physics literature. So we know it's real. Experimentally it's detected. The Casimir shift, for example, shows clearly that it's there, and it does generate energetic effects in your actual materials. It turns out that in the modern view, the modern quantum mechanical view, if you apply that knowledge that's been gained there, what you find is that the vacuum is fiercely active. It's a fierce energy flux and going in all directions at all times. The energy density of that, as estimated by various physicists, is extremely high. Uh, for example, in one cubic centimeter, if you could take the raw energy in that cubic centimeter and condense it into mass, divided by c squared, you would have more observable mass result from that than our largest telescope can see in the observable universe and all the stars and planets today. And so the, the energy that's there is extremely dense and extremely fierce. 
This drives everything that we call physical reality, from the quantum level right on up to the observed level and the observed world that we live in. Everything is energetically driven by the vacuum. The Sea of Energy in Which the Earth Floats was a revolutionary book written by T. Henry Moray, an electrical engineer and Tesla enthusiast who in the early 20s began working on a device he claimed intercepted radiant energy from outer space. His solid state detector, the Moray valve, was designed with a complex series of semiconductors, high voltage capacitors and transformers hooked up to an antenna and a ground wire. By stimulating the existing oscillations of space energy, his radiant energy device ran for days, putting out 50 kilowatts of electricity. His public demonstrations attracted newspaper coverage and scientists from Bell Laboratories and the Department of Agriculture's Rural Electrification Administration. Although no one could find evidence of fraud, neither could anyone explain how the radiant energy device worked. During the 30s, he developed semiconductors and transistors that were far ahead of their time. Unfortunately, as all too many inventors have suffered, when he refused to sell out to powerful interests, Moray and his family were threatened, shot at, and their laboratory ransacked. Ignored by the U.S. Patent Office, Moray quietly stopped public disclosure of the device after it was destroyed by his assistant, Felix Frazier, a communist sympathizer who was frustrated Moray declined his repeated offers to take that technology to Russia. Today, Moray's sons, John and Richard, continue to pursue their father's dream. In Europe, Victor Schauberger's vortex experiments during the 1930s resulted in an advanced understanding of how the spiraling motions inherent in all natural systems reverse the effects of entropy. By studying the properties of inwardly spiraling water, he created an implosion generator that concentrated electrical charge. Victor Schauberger is one of my heroes who talked about a, a possible science based on the, the uh, inward motion rather than the let's explode everything, blow, break it up and, and uh, study the atom by breaking it up into little pieces. Let's study the atom by looking at uh, how it wants to move naturally in a spiraling motion and the same with uh, everywhere you look in nature. Schauberger's ideas became widely known before World War II when he was coerced to work for the Nazis on exotic discs that resembled flying saucers as well as his energy generator. In 1958 he traveled to the United States where he was told he could manufacture his devices but he was duped into signing over all of his rights, and none of his inventions were ever developed. Returning to Austria, he died a bitter and broken man. Visionary philosopher, artist, and scientist Walter Russell's contributions to the understanding of energy are significant, even though ignored by mainstream academia. Russell's revised periodical table of the elements, based on a spiral, predicted many unknown elements and isotopes like plutonium.